would not back off, and that was one of the um, considerations when he committed to the Air Force Academy. He was like uh, a lot of other first-year cadets there, wondering, what am I doing here? And he was always real active in a lot of things. He was active in Boy Scouts and, and, and the Y, and I used to enjoy swimming. He was on the swimming team, but we lived near the lake, and he was always down there at the beach swimming with his friends. And uh, I must say, he's always had uh, great love and respect for his family. Lance and his family were very close. Uh, Lance talked about his family all the time. He, had, he obviously had a happy childhood and liked his family and, and was in close touch with his family. And Lance, Lance was a family person. I am an American fighting in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. I will never surrender of my own free will. If in command, I will never surrender the members of my command while they still have the means to resist. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information or take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. When questioned, should I become a prisoner of war, I am required to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies or harmful to their cause. I will never forget that I am an American, fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. I think we need to have a code of conduct. Everybody needs to have ethical standards and moral standards that they live to. And by expressing them in a code of conduct, you, you give people something to hold on to. And, and that helps. When, when you're in a time of, of difficulty and, and stress, if, if, you can, if you can have things you believe in, and something that you're working towards, it makes it much easier to deal with it. Obviously, his behavior uh, uh, as a prisoner and throughout that ordeal uh, reflect the highest ideals and dedication and to the code of conduct and, and should be studied by all of us as certainly uh, something that we ought to understand, model, and if ever confronted with that situation, follow with the same uh, dedication and vigor that Lance did. Until his death, Lance P. Sijon loved life and everything it encompassed. As a child in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Lance played hard, involved himself completely in everything he did, and tried his best to live life to its fullest. After high school, Lance entered the Naval Academy Preparatory School in Bainbridge, Maryland, a year-long program to help students who may have academic or physical problems improve their chances of getting an appointment to the Naval Academy or the Air Force Academy. Lance wanted to go to the Air Force Academy and he saw the preparatory school as a strategic move to better his chances. When he arrived at the Naval Prep School, he was asked if he would mind having a black roommate. Lance's parents taught him to respect people for who they are as individuals. Thus, Fletcher H. Flash Wiley became his roommate 
and friend. In 1960, when we were all picked to go and they sent us down to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas, uh, America was a very different country than it is now. I was the only black cadet in the prep school uh, with the Air Force contingent. And uh, when we went to uh, boot camp, the, uh, they asked around to these guys who came from all over the country who would have a problem living with me as a, as a roommate because I was the only black person there. I know there were others that spoke up uh, favorably, but uh, Lance Sajon was the guy that, uh, that was uh, picked to be my roommate. While the Naval Academy Preparatory School was physically and mentally challenging for Lance, he, like all cadets, found the Air Force Academy even more demanding. During cadet basic training, Bart Holliday, a fellow cadet assigned to Lance's squadron years later, remembered when he first met Lance Sijon. I first met Lance during our basic cadet training. Because I was a half an inch shorter, I always had to march and run behind him. The runs became increasingly exhausting, but by focusing on Lance right in front of me, with his quest for victory in every stride he made, I was able to go on. Without him as an example, I would have surely quit. Lance, like many cadets, found academics to be the most difficult part of academy life. He spent countless hours struggling with the books and getting extra help from fellow cadets and instructors when he wasn't playing football. In his sophomore year, Lance told his parents that he was worried about making it. But if you can qualify to get in the Air Force Academy and finish the academic program, you're pretty smart because there's a lot of other things going on and just academics or athletics. Here you've got the military training program, you've got the squadron problems, you've got your squadron duties, you've got you're trying to be an athlete, and uh, you put all that together and it's called being very busy. So he hits a real feather in his cap uh, and the rest of our grads uh, to come in here and graduate because it's not an easy school. He continued to struggle with academics throughout his junior year. It never seemed to get easier. Then, as a senior, after becoming a member of the varsity football team, one of his goals, Lance, quit football. He made a tearful, really absolutely a tearful decision that uh, he was going to give up football. And it was a part of his life and it opened the door for him to become a cadet. And I think uh, emotionally it was a tough decision for him. but. He had his ducks in a row. He knew uh, what he really wanted to do. Lance made the tough decision, the right decision. And after four demanding years, Lance and his classmates graduated in June 1965. After graduation, Lance got his pilot wings at Laredo Air Force Base, Texas, after completing both T-37 and T-38 flight instruction. He then went to George Air Force Base, California, for upgrade training in the F-4, one of the primary fighter aircraft being used in the Vietnam War. On the night of November 9, 1967, with only 48 missions left to fly before going home, Lance stood before his barracks dresser at Da Nang Air Base, Vietnam, staring quietly at the pictures of his family. As part of his pre-mission ritual, he would mentally spend time with his family at their red brick Tudor house overlooking Lake Michigan. This normally had a calming effect on Lance as he remembered all the good times. But tonight was different. As he prepared for his night mission over Laos, Lance was more quiet than usual because yesterday, his best friend, Lee Ellis, had been shot down. Tonight, Lance would be flying as a backseater to his squadron commander, Lieutenant Colonel John Armstrong, a West Point graduate and veteran of the Korean War. Beside them flew another F-4 Phantom. Both Phantoms carried three 750-pound bombs fused to arm six seconds after release. But when Lieutenant Colonel Armstrong released the bombs during their attack run, they malfunctioned and exploded almost immediately, filling the cockpit with a blinding flash of light. Instinctively, Lance pulled the ejection handle and was blown clear of the damaged aircraft. As he passed through the thick 
jungle canopy, his helmet, parachute, and auxiliary survival pack were ripped away. On November 11th, the day and a half after Lance was downed, two F-4Ds were heading for their targets north of Hanoi when they heard a Mayday beeper coming from the jungle below. The beeper's transmitter was asked to identify himself. AWOL-1 Bravo, Lance answered in a calm voice. I'm kind of hurt bad. Compound fracture. My head's hurt pretty bad too. I was unconscious all day yesterday. As the formal rescue began, Lance was asked for further identification and responded. Side John, Lance Peter, First Lieutenant, United States Air Force. He was also asked a prearranged question, the answer to which Lance had written on his authenticator card. Who is the greatest football team in the world? Lying on the jungle floor, bone protruding through his left leg, the three smaller fingers of his right hand dislocated, and the wound behind his left ear throbbing with pain, Lance answered, the Green Bay Packers. With his identity confirmed as a downed American pilot and a fix on his location, the rescue mission went into full swing. The Americans were determined to get Lance out. However, the North Vietnamese Army was just as determined to capture Lance and make his rescue attempt a very costly one. By the end of the day, the North Vietnamese had severely damaged several aircraft, wounded several airmen, and had prevented Lance's rescue. But as the sun set, Lance saw the chopper rotor blast on the trees above his position. He immediately radioed for them to drop the penetrator, a recovery device that could lift Lance to safety. Chopper pilot said he was sending down a pararescue jumper, a rescue specialist. Negative. There are bad guys down here. Drop the penetrator. I'll crawl to you. Lance pulled himself across jagged stones as he hacked away at thorny vines with his knife. The penetrator and rescue laid on the ground only 20 feet away. But because of his injuries, Lance's progress was slow, too slow. The North Vietnamese Army continued their assault, and the chopper, taking tremendous ground fire, had to pull away, taking Lance's chances for freedom with him. At dawn, 23 aircraft were ready to continue the rescue attempt, which had failed a day earlier, when 108 aircraft and four ground radar sites had taken part. Time and again, they waited for Lance to respond to their radio calls. Each time, the reply was silent. The night before, Lance had fallen into a sinkhole and had either damaged his radio or forgotten to turn off the emergency beep and drain the battery. Two hours into the second day's rescue mission with no response from Lance and taking heavy ground fire from the North Vietnamese, the mission commander canceled the rescue mission. As Lance pulled himself out of the sinkhole, he heard the distinctive roar of the F-4s in the distance. Weak and in tremendous pain, Lance passed out. Just before dark, he regained consciousness and began formulating his own escape plan. Using his compass, he would head east away from the North Vietnamese and toward freedom. Lance was determined to survive. He would never surrender, not to the North Vietnamese, not to the terrain. He firmly believed in the motto, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that is what he did for the next six weeks, advancing maybe 100 yards a day. He dragged his broken and starving body over almost three miles of dense, insect-infested jungle. Always in his mind was a belief that escape was a duty he owed to his uniform, to himself, and to the family he desperately wanted to see again. But fate once again stepped in. On Christmas morning, the North Vietnamese Army found Lance passed out beside a troop road. After evading the enemy for 46 days, Lance became a prisoner of war. Prisoners of war in Vietnam had few rights. North Vietnam had signed the Geneva Convention, but they did not believe it applied to this particular conflict since neither side had declared war. Rather, 
North Vietnam considered any airman shot down an air pirate and treated them as such. Captain Guy Gruders and Major Bob Craner, shot down in their forward air control plane, had been clubbed and trussed with their arms tightly tied behind them, elbows touching in unbelievable pain. A favorite trick of the North Vietnamese Army. Gruders now sat bent over on the straw and mud floor of his cell, bound in leg irons and cuffs at the bamboo prison north of Vien. He screamed at his captors to stop pounding the hell out of the new guy in a cell nine feet away. But the clubs continued to strike flesh and bone, producing piercing screams of pain. Gruders heard the voice of the North Vietnamese officer known as the rodent ask, name of base commander. A weak but defiant Lance Sijon said, I'm not going to tell you anything, it's against the code. The interrogation went on for hours and screams filled Lance's cell as they continued to beat him mercilessly. The next morning, Gruders and Craner were ordered to take the prisoner to the latrine and clean him up. On the straw floor in front of them lay Lance. Infested with vermin, his entire body covered with welts from his beatings. Lance looked up at the two men and asked, Aren't you Guy Gruders? Staring questionably at the almost unidentifiable mass of flesh before him, Gruders said, Yeah, who are you? Lance Sijon, he answered. Gruders immediately identified Lance. They had been in the 21st Squadron together at the Academy and had both been members of the skydiving team. As Gruders and Craner cared for Lance, he wanted to know, how secure is this place and what are the chances of getting out of here? Inside this badly beaten body, Saijan's spirit was undaunted. Gruders later found out that Lance was captured on Christmas Day, 1967, and was given food and put under observation. Even in his weakened condition, his desire to abide by the code of conduct was stronger than his pain. He overpowered his guard and escaped into the jungle only to be recaptured a few hours later. The rodent continued to torture Lance, but only got name, rank, and serial number. Lance made every effort to escape. A guard caught him digging in his cell with a tin cup and beat his injured hand and broken leg with a bamboo cane. But Lance believed in every fiber of his body that he must continue to resist by all means available and make every effort to escape. Undaunted by his captors, Lance clawed at the floor, trying to dig his way out with his hands for three days until he was caught and again brutally clubbed. As the monsoon rains began, Lance's condition worsened with the onset of disease. Just before his death, Saijan, Gruders, and Craner were transferred to the Hanoi Hilton prison camp. Still, Lance's spirit was unconquerable as he tried to lure a guard into his Hanoi cell in an attempt to overpower him and escape. Prior to his death, Lance could barely mouth his words and use signals to say he was okay. On the eighth day after being transferred to the Hanoi Hilton, Lance's eyes flashed with comprehension as the guards lifted him onto a pallet to take him to the hospital. He knew they were taking him away to die. Gathering all his strength, he yelled out in a loud, clear voice, Dad, help me. Dad, I need you. In memory of Lance's struggle and dedication to duty, on May 31, 1976, one of two dormitories at the Air Force Academy was named Cy John Hall. Years later, at a reunion for the class of 65, Lance's classmates and friends remembered him. I just am happy to remember him as a, uh, as a dedicated, committed kind of fellow who, who had his own strong sense of right and wrong. He was exceptional in his personal bearing, uh, I always thought. Lance just had something about him. and. The best way I can describe it is, is a dignity or an inner strength that, that came through. Several decades later, after his heroic actions and his death in Vietnam, 
Lance's life still impacts cadets undergoing training at the Air Force Academy. Well, an impact and inspiration Lance has been in the lives of many young men, and military and otherwise. If this man could do this, I can do this. Well, when I uh, get into certain situations as a cadet, sometimes I wonder, you know, this is really hard, but compared to what uh, Lance Sijon went through after he uh, evaded capture and when he was captured and was uh, interred as a prisoner of war, I, I think this is cake compared to that, and I use him kind of as an example of how to act. Lance P. Sijon made the ultimate sacrifice for his country. He gave his life. He believed in the code of conduct, love of country, family, friends, and though they were written down many years later, he also believed in and personified the core values of the Air Force. The triad of core values consist of integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. I think the most important thing that, that my class and most of us got out of the academy was the honor code and, and the, the belief in integrity. Uh, we had a relationship when we were at the academy and, and ever since that, that we have absolute trust in each other. Service before self, he lived through, he lived for his other fellow prisoners of war, he was trying to escape and to help them to escape, even at risk to his own life. Uh, he worked hard uh, militarily and was successful. He worked very hard academically. I mean, he, I think uh, you would find people that would say that Lance struggled academically here, and he did, but he worked very hard at it and he was successful at it because he knew that was important to his goal of getting a commission, graduating from the academy, and becoming a pilot. So I think certainly he models our, our core values. From 1966 to 1973, 12 airmen won the Medal of Honor in Vietnam, many posthumously. On March 4, 1976, eight years after Lance Saigon died in a North Vietnamese prisoner of war camp, President Gerald Ford presented his parents with this nation's highest award the Medal of Honor. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3, 1863, has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor posthumously to Captain Lance P. Sijon, United States Air Force. While on a flight over North Vietnam on 9 November 1967, Captain Sijon ejected from his disabled aircraft and successfully evaded capture for more than six weeks. During this time, he was seriously injured and suffered from shock and extreme weight loss due to lack of food. After being captured by North Vietnamese soldiers, Captain Saijan was taken to a holding point for subsequent transfer to a prisoner of war camp. In his emaciated and crippled condition, he overpowered one of his guards and crawled into the jungle, only to be recaptured after several hours. He was then transferred to another prison camp where he was kept in solitary confinement and interrogated at length. During interrogation, he was severely tortured. However, he did not divulge any information to his captors. Captain Saijon lapsed into delirium and was placed in the care of another prisoner. During his intermittent periods of consciousness until his death, he never complained of his physical condition and on several occasions spoke of future escape attempts. Captain Saijon's extraordinary heroism and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty at the cost of his life are in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Air Force and reflect great credit upon himself and the armed forces of the United States. I know Lance as a warrior would want to die with a sword in his hand and that's what he did. 